So I'm gonna put my video on just for a second to say hi. I'm on um, my university internet, so I'm not sure how great it is. So I'll turn it off during the presentation and then during Q&A, um, I'll turn it back on again. But I just wanted to say hi to everyone that I'm actually here <laughs> in real. Okay, so thank you all for coming tonight. I know it's a super busy time of the year and there's so much exciting um, activities going on in the bee yard and the garden and everything out there. So I totally appreciate all of you coming out. So I'm gonna share my presentation and hopefully this looks right. And so um, talking tonight about grooming behavior and I put ankle biting in quotes cause that was that phrase, it, I, it kind of rubs me the wrong way cause they don't really have ankles, those little mites. Um, but, but the idea is that we have bees that are chewing on these, these um, mites as well. And so hopefully you'll never see um, a colony as, as infested as you're seeing here. I'm oftentimes keeping really infested colonies um, for the sake of, of research, um, but it also makes for some nice visuals for you all to see what you should never see happening in your colonies. Um, so we'll be talking about uh, some of the behavioral resistance to Varroa, specifically about grooming behavior and some of the research that's been done. Um, I think it's really important to talk about um, basic research as well as some of the practical applications for you all. I think it's nice to have a balance so you know uh, where your uh, tax dollars are going in terms of supporting research, but also um, getting some tips in terms of what you can do now. Um, speaking of what we can do now, I was just going to point out, um, so it's late here, but I just got uh, almost finished yeah. dealing with this whole mess out yeah, in uh, on, on campus. I guess. I am going to Yeah. Cute. Sorry, okay. everyone who's not muted, please mute yourself. And I just changed the setting. So once I mute everyone, they're not going to be able to unmute right. themselves until the end. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Um, so, yeah. So, just so you all know, like I'm going to talk about some research tonight, but um, I'm out there with the bees just like, like everyone else and dealing with the, the messes that are out there, too. Um, and just some caveats, too. When we talk about bees and beekeeping, just pointing out that there are many ways to keep bees. And so, that's actually one of the, the fabulous things I think about bees is that we can still um, put in a little bit of our own characteristics and personalities and philosophies in terms of how we actually manage our bees. There are many ways we can do uh, beekeeping, which is, um, I don't know, it's, it's, to me, it's like a nice creative art in terms of how um, people manage their bees. Everyone does it a little bit differently. Um, but part of what my job is as an extension professor is really trying to make sure that uh, the beekeeping community and industry is supported. And I think a big part of that is thinking about the basic foundation. I love puns too. So like just the word foundation, I, I think is awesome too. Uh, but these foundations and thinking about the biology of the bees and teaching the biology of the bees um, equally, if not more so than beekeeping. Um, the, the process of beekeeping um, is important, but really in order to do that properly, we have to understand the biology of the bees and how they work so we can best work with them rather than trying to constantly um, make them do what we want, essentially. Um, and then just knowing that there are you know, different considerations for different reasons for beekeeping um, and everyone has their own different interests as well. And so taking that into account, I think, is, is part of the whole beekeeping idea is that we have different considerations and not everyone's gonna keep bees the same way, the same way. And that diversity in beekeeping, I think is something that is, is to be valued. And so now would be the time if we were meeting in person that I would ask you, um, you know, why you're keeping bees and whether or not you keep bees for honey production. Um, and I don't know how many of you uh, do that. I'm going to actually go through and hear some more backgrounds. I'm going to go through and meet a few more people. Um, honey production. Um, how many of you are keeping bees for pollination services and whether that's contracted pollination service um, or if it's just, you know, not just, but you know, within the neighborhood, backyard uh, pollination in, in your local area. Um, usually I don't run into too many of, of those, um, in, at least in my state. Um, and then also whether or not people are keeping bees for fun. And hopefully when I ask that question, everybody raises their hand um, because if you aren't having fun with beekeeping, um, there are a lot of other easier and cheap, cheaper hobbies to do, I think. And so um, hopefully we all still find something that we really enjoy about it um, and that we 
focus on that and try to um, keep increasing that part of beekeeping too. So I wanna ask people like, why do you keep bees or what's your plan? Um, you know, what are you, what are you gonna do this year? What, what are your goals? Are they different from last year? Hopefully they are. Hopefully you're aiming higher or doing, looking to improve upon something. And, and what is that? Is it just that you really enjoy keeping bees? And what is the thing that's really enjoyable that you can somehow increase? Or if you are doing honey production, you know, what are your goals? How much more do you want to produce this year? Do you want to try to get into varietals or what are, what do you want to do? And so thinking about that as kind of long-term goals. Oh, and then also, you know, we are a special group of people when we talk about fun and um, fun is relative for us, right? And so sometimes it is a little bit fun. I'll share some human emoji pictures with you later on, but you know, we are um, an interesting group that works with stinging insects and has fun, have fun with it, um, which is also really awesome. But really, we're, we're looking to support these bees um, and to make sure that we have healthy um, populations of pollinators to also then help us in terms of food production, as well as just the landscape being um, how we like it and how we um, like seeing it, especially in, in natural areas. A lot of that's due to pollinators. And so there's a lot of value there. So one of the big reasons that we're here tonight is to talk about parasitic varroa mites. And so what we'll be talking about tonight is just a tad bit about varroa biology um, and then behavioral resistance to varroa, specifically talking about varroa sensitive hygiene. We'll just touch on that, but then focusing a lot of time on grooming behavior and some of the research that's been done there. And then the other area of behavioral resistance is the human behavior um, that come in, comes into play. So that's more of the applied part of it. And so just as a little bit of a heads up of where we're gonna go tonight. Um, and again, this is a really um, important topic. And I, I mean, at least where I am, I, I'm glad to hear you all are um, still interested in hearing about Varroa. I, have, I have had groups out here say, oh, we don't wanna hear about Varroa anymore. We're tired of hearing about Varroa. So now I, I give a talk where I just call them murder mites. And then that, create, you know, I'm gonna jump on the bandwagon of these uh, murder Asian hornets, Asian giant hornets. And so if I give a talk on murder mites, people get excited, but it's still just a talk on varroa mites, but it gets them to show up. Okay, so a little bit of just about basic varroa biology. If we look at their life cycle, um, you can tell basically based off of this picture um, that we've been studying varroa mites in their life cycle for a long while. Um, if we look up here, we're starting with number one, we have this um, adult bee that has a, an adult mite that's um, already been mated. So it's a female mite that we're going to call a foundress mite because she's going to found her own call or her own um, a family of offspring here. And so when we look, think about the life cycle of varroa mites, it's basically split, in, split into two parts. There's the dispersal or what we had been calling phoretic before, but the University of Maryland is pushing for a change and calling it dispersal. So you may see um, both of those terms being used in um, references. And so that's when the, bee, when the mites are on the adult bee. And then there's the reproductive phase of their life cycle, which is when they're in the, the brood cells reproducing. And so we're here, we're starting with number one. So the mite is in the dispersal phase and is quickly going to jump into a cell that has um, a larva that's about to be capped off. It's about five, five and a half days old. And at that point now is entering its reproductive cycle. So this mite's already been mated. She gets into the cell, she goes into the, she hides in the brood food so she's not being detected. She has nice little, um, almost like snorkel gear so she can go stay in the brood food but not drown and she can go into a bit of a diapause, a resting phase until that cell gets capped off. And then now we're down at number four here. Once that cell gets capped off and that um, larva starts to become a prepupa, that mite comes out of its diapause and starts feeding on that prepupa. And so this is the stimulus for that mite to then start getting into reproductive mode. So um, as the bee continues its development, the mite continues its reproductive cycle here. And so it will first lay an egg about 60 hours after that cell was capped. And then it lays, and that will be um, the male offspring. And then every 30 hours after that, she'll lay subsequent eggs that will be females, so daughters. Um, it takes time for these um, eggs to hatch and then for the mites themselves to mature. They go through different life stages. And then the um, adult females will mate with the adult males 
So in this situation that we're showing in this picture, you can see here that it's, it's inbreeding. So the son is mating with the daughters, um, but there are times of the year, especially in the fall where there's limited brood, where you'll have more than one founder's mite enter a cell. So in that case, there could be a little bit more genetic mixing that could happen, um, but there is just a higher level of inbreeding that happens with, with mites relative to, um, for instance, the bees themselves. Um, what we see here then is that after those, um, that mating happens in the cell, uh, that bee will emerge out with that founder's mite and any of those mature female mites that have been mated. The immature females that haven't finished their um, development and have not been mated yet, and that male, they end up just dying in the cell. Um, they don't look the same. I'll show you a picture in just a second. They're more susceptible to desiccation and drying out. Um, so just that adult female, uh, the founders, as well as the mature females will leave. Um, and then when they leave the cell, it's very easy for those mites to transfer from one bee to another just because of the close contact that happens with bees. So if you think about how long the development of a worker bee is, you think, oh my goodness, there's a lot of uh, developing mites that could um, happen, that could be produced from one of these life cycles. But really you only get about one to two mature uh, mated daughter mites being produced in those life cycles. So it's not a huge number. Um, it's not like they're producing, you know, like five offspring per um, light or per round of reproduction, but then the complicating factor is that each one of these females can do this life, the reproductive cycle three to four times. So that's how you start getting this high growth in the level of, of mites in the colony. And so um, if you ever pop open your cells, you may be unfortunate and unlucky enough to see a whole little happy family of mites here. Um, in this upper, on the upper wall, you can see the founder's mites. So this was the, the mom here. This is what we typically think of when we see these mites. This is um, dark reddish brown um, sclerotized uh, female here. And then you can see the developing stages here. And this, these are why they don't survive um, when they're immature. Uh, once that bee emerges, they're just, they don't have that hard sclerotized body and they're really susceptible to desiccation. Um, but with furrow mites, it's not just the mites that we're worried about. These are parasitic mites. They do feed on the developing bees as we've seen here. And they also can feed on the adult bees. But um, the other, the double whammy with them is that they can spread viruses. And so um, here we see a picture of a bee that has deformed wing virus, which bees can also have independent of varroa mites. But typically we start seeing um, more problems when you have a secondary stressor come into the system like parasitic mites. That's when those viruses start replicating and, and causing um, high titers or high levels in the individuals. Just like with humans, once our systems, our immune systems get stressed out, um, the viruses will start replicating and that's when you start having um, visible symptoms here. Oh, sorry, jumped over there. Um, speaking of visible symptoms, you can oftentimes see these out in front of your colonies. Um, you'll see these, these poor little bees um, trying to get back into the colony or, or even leave the colony, but they can't fly uh, because they have these little deformed wings, which is really sad. Um, sometimes they get kicked out as well. A really a, a sad situation. And oftentimes we get calls from folks who think they have a, um, pesticide kill and they see all these bees out from their colony that um, are having trouble and they think that it's due to pesticides and if you take a closer look you see that they actually um, just have deformed wings which is um, problematic for a different reason obviously. Okay let me okay, switch over and then the other thing I want to point out too is that these viruses do not just affect the workers. It's bad enough that they affect the workers but they can also affect our reproductive. So this, we can't really tell from here, um, but this is a, a drone. And so if reproductives start getting these viruses, you can imagine that they're not gonna be able to have, go out on, on, on successful mating flights, and that's gonna be really problematic too. And regardless, this is a huge loss in terms of resources. A lot of um, time and energy and food went into developing these workers and these drones and even queens um, that, that carry these viruses that are basically gonna, going to be um, duds in the colony. They won't be able to, to serve their function. So really problematic. And we really wanna try to make sure that we get our viruses under control as well as our mites. It's a little bit easier said than done. And this is my little joke 
because this is it is kind of a sad topic. And so I always tell people Lowe's has almost everything that you could need. So I've gone to like three Lowe's and I've seen they have they all have the same aisle here where they have I it's some kind of a valve, maybe a dishwasher valve, but I like to think that they have deformed wing virus fittings for those those poor bees that have deformed wings. But sorry, corny joke. Um, but there aren't solutions for these bees that have deformed wings. So it's a huge loss when we have um, outbreaks of these, these bees that have high titers of virus that won't be able to fly and that will then be spreading the virus around within the colony. So when you start seeing bees with deformed wings, um, you, you do have high titers and it's time to start looking for mites and then controlling mites. But again, you can have deformed wing virus without having um, uh, mites, but it's usually something that you see um, together. So I always tell people they're seeing deformed wings to take a look and do, um, do a mite check um, to go along with that. And there are other viruses that are uh, maybe less common or less visible for, for people to see. Um, this is chronic bee paralysis virus. So there's actually two types of this uh, or two symptoms of this. One of them um, that was described by Rothenbuehler uh, back in like the 50s, I believe, or maybe the 40s, was called hairless black syndrome. And so you can see this bee here has, um, is, is hairless and is black. Um, and it's a very different type of coloration than a bee that is, um, a, you know, a bee that happens to get wet from going into a feeder or, um, is, is just aged and has lost her fuzz. She looks very different and odd. And so this is caused by chronic bee paralysis virus, which also can cause paralysis in bees, um, a longer term paralysis where you start seeing symptoms later on. So really problematic because we have many different viruses that can be vectored by grow mites, but we don't have good treatments for the viruses. So basically how do we deal with viruses? We deal with parasitic mites. And that's easier said than done, right? So I, I say that, but uh, we're gonna get into to why that's challenging. But I wanted to point out too that it's really important to, to know that we have this association between viruses and burrow mites. So this was a fairly recent study um, looking at the relative expression of the amount of viruses. So that's what we're seeing on the y-axis here. It's just, don't even worry about the numbers, but just think of it as how relatively how much virus they have. And in colonies that were not challenged with mites, which you can barely see on here, a, a little tiny blue bar maybe at day eight, um, versus colonies that were challenged with mites, you can see that the virus levels, again, because they're being stressed by these parasitic mites that are also vectoring and spreading the virus, that the level of the virus just, it just skyrockets to the point where they even have to cut off the, the, the chart here, the graph, because it would become so high vertically up there. Um, so just after you know, less than a week, um, those the level of deformed wing virus went up really high because those bees were, or as a result of those bees being challenged with, with um, deformed, or sorry, with parasitic mites, with varroa mites. And so I point this out too, because a lot of folks will wait um, to do their mite treatments until later in the season. And we are lucky that we have a lot of mite products that are really good about knocking the mites down. But if you wait too long, you'll have really high virus titers in your colony. And those mite treatments will knock down your, your mite levels, but they won't knock down your virus levels. And so that's why it's really good to make sure that you keep your mite loads low throughout the season. And, and even though those products work really well, don't wait until um, too late in the season when now your viruses are too high and then you're going to go into the winter time with high viruses, which will then have, decrease your likelihood of, of overwintering with success. Okay, so now we're going to talk about managing Varroa. Ideally, anytime we're managing a pest, we're following integrated pest management. And with that, um, we basically are, are trying to use um, a strategy in which we have multiple methods that we're um, implementing and that we're using chemicals as a last resort and we're limiting how much we're using. And so in the bee world, bee world we do have chemical miticides that we use, um, but we also have these behaviors, varroa sensitive hygiene, as well as grooming behavior. And we do have a lot of other IPM methods that, that can be implemented as well. And so this is what we call the IPM triangle. And ideally we're starting down here with a lot of preventative measures. So some of that can have to do with like the, the, the um, stocks that you buy or um, making sure that you're, you're not doing anything in terms of um, trying, 
you're not following any practices that can increase the likelihood of you even having the mites. And then having some cultural methods, biological methods, physical, mechanical methods. So things um, even like screen bottom boards can help, you know, a little bit with keeping a, a few of the mites off the bees. Um, but when you look at the survey data, that alone does not um, necessarily lead to, or the beekeepers that follow and use things like screen bottom boards don't necessarily report uh, lower levels of losses, but I, I'm up for anything that's going to keep a few more mites off of my bees. Um, also, where I am, the, the ventilation um, can be really helpful as well. Um, and then, of course, chemicals up here as a last resort. Um, and then even within chemicals, we have different levels of chemicals, right? We have soft chemicals and we have some harder chemicals and synthetics. So we do have a lot of different options. And ideally, we're using a combination of factors. And we can combine these to get the most bang for our buck. So things like the miticides, um, most of those miticides are only going to be effective on mites that are on the adult bees. So in that um, dispersing or phoretic stage. But in reality, on average, most of your mites will be actually in the cells reproducing, in those cap cells. So they won't be exposed to those chemicals. So one way we can um, try to, to um, I guess, maneuver a little bit within our colonies to increase the likelihood or increase the uh, efficacy of our uh, miticide treatments is by doing things like breaking the brood cycle so that more there's there's less brood for the mites to reproduce in and then more of the mites are on the adult bees so that when you do your chemical treatments more, more of them are going to be exposed and that way the, the treatment will in in a way be more effective so there are different ways we can combine um, methods here to get the, the most effective treatment possible um, but ideally we're also thinking about beyond treatments, how do we make our bees or how do we help the bees help themselves? And so there are behaviors against um, parasitic mites. And so I'm going to go through two of them that have been described um, scientifically to limit the mite population from growing in the colony. One of them is varroa sensitive hygiene. And we're not going to talk about that too much tonight. And you may already have some of these, um, you may have purchased stock um, from these lines that were developed. Um, Bees that exhibit this trait, this is a trait that can, can be in, in any stock, but we do have some selected stock that's been bred to exhibit high levels of this behavior. But when this behavior is exhibited, basically bees are detecting mite infested brood, possibly targeting cells with reproducing mites, and then they're uncapping them and they're removing those, those mite infested brood. Um, they're oftentimes just uncapping cells too, and just that uncapping keeps those mites from reproducing and that can slow down the growth of the, the mites as well, the mite reproduction as well. And then grooming behavior, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, and I'm sure you all are pretty familiar with, with seeing bees. That's obviously not a honeybee on the, the right, but I just, I, I don't know, I've just got a cute picture of a, a native bee grooming and I thought I'd include that. So you see our bees grooming all the time. Um, but in the case of mites, the adult bees are actually grooming those mites off of themselves and each other. So they're removing the mites off of their bodies. And we're gonna talk about that in uh, more detail. One thing I did wanna point out though about varroa sensitive hygiene is to understand what that may look like in your colony. And so if these lines were developed, these highly, um, or these lines of bees that have been bred to show high levels of varroa sensitive hygiene were developed by um, John Harbo and Jeff Harris, who were both at the USDA lab in Baton Rouge. Um, Harbo is now retired and Jeff Harris is now at Mississippi State University. Uh, but this is a really awesome um, trait that they bred for. And so basically what we're seeing here is um, a frame of, of, of developing bees and these horizontal lines that are um, uncapped, those are the ones that the researchers did to make sure that this control half or this, this half that went into control colonies have the same infestation level of mites as this half that went into a, a stock of our colony that was bred for high levels of varroa sensitive hygiene. And what you can see is after a few days, there are more uncapped cells in the the, the half that went into the varroa sensitive hygiene um, colony. Those, those colonies, those bees, um, they like, as I mentioned before, they like to uncap cells uh, and they're good at removing that mite infested brood, whereas the controls let those bees continue to develop. Um, and then those mites are also developing and reproducing in those cells. And so um, that's one reason why I, I point this out is because 
we oftentimes put a lot of weight into brood pattern. And there was actually a really nice paper that came out a couple of years ago uh, by Katie Lee explaining that brood pattern is not um, the only um, indicator or it's not a reliable indicator alone of your queen quality because of things like this. So actually you would see this and you say, oh, that's a bad brood pattern, but it's actually indicative of hygienic behavior in your bees. So that's a good thing. Um, and sometimes these bees are uncapping cells just to uncap cells and there may not even be mites in there. Um, so you don't wanna necessarily have full blown VSHBs. You wanna have um, like the F1 that has been one cross out from the purebred lines so that they aren't just on capping cells, but they have a healthy level of hygienic behavior. We don't want OCD bees. Um, but you can see here too, if you were to see a, a pattern like this, you could look deeper into this to figure out why is the, the pattern spotty? It, this is very a, a different type of a spotty pattern because you can see that these are pupae that are uncapped here. And so it's really different than if you start seeing um, a spotty brood pattern where it's, um, you don't see older pupae that are being um, uncapped, but you see uh, missing larvae and cells, or you see young larvae that are um, not capped in there and spotty. So just wanted to remind you of that, is that brood pattern um, can actually be indicative of things like hygienic behavior. And it's not necessarily always a bad thing if it looks spotty. Okay, so more on grooming behavior. Um, so just wanna to touch on some of the, the research that I worked on at Purdue University. And so just pointing out that what we're trying to, what we were trying to do um, is to look for differences in genotypes that are associated with difference in phenotypes. So the phenotype here being grooming. So are they good groomers or poor groomers? And there are different ways we can measure that phenotype of being good or bad. Um, and I'll show you a, a video of that in just a second. And then we want to try to find out what are the genetics that underlie that behavior? Because can we breed for that rather than breeding for the actual phenotype? Is there a way that we can um, do a more subjective way of, of breeding? And so here's this um, short video clip where uh, I'll, I don't know, I'll replay it, I guess. But I just want to point out that there's a bee up here on the top that has a green rear end. She has a mite on her thorax. I put it there. And then there's a bee down here with a yellow um, abdomen or rear end. And I put a, 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 a varro mite on her thorax too. And you can see that their responses to having a mite put on them is drastically different. The one up on the top, the green bee, completely fine having that mite there. That's not at all the type of bee we want to have, right? We don't want, I like coexistence, but I don't want my bees to coexist with mites in this way. I really like to see bees like this one at the bottom here that cannot stand having that mite on her. And so we run these assays and we look at um, how responsive the bees are to having a mite being put on them. And so there are different ways we can gauge this. So we can look at how long after I put the mite on their back, does it take them to respond? Some of them respond immediately. Some of them will go three minutes and not even try to, to take a swipe at it essentially. Then there are um, different levels of assessing how hard they're basically trying to swipe the mites off. In this case, this bee is using multiple legs. She's actually making contact with it. Some of them, they, they do kind of a, a, a half attempt to, to, to swipe at it. And it's, it's like they aren't even making contact with it. It's almost just, you know, when you try to scratch that spot in your back, but you just I'm going to get the general area, but not quite it. So some of them try, but not all, not, not in an effective way. And some are actually able to get that mite to move and they're able to remove that mite off of that sweet spot on the thorax. And once they get that mite to move, usually to the underside of the body, that's when they are really much more effective in terms of being able to crunch down and then remove that, uh, take a bite out of that mite and get it off of their body. So once they can get it off that, that sweet spot, it can be really good while the, the mite is mobile. If it's a mite that's in, you know, this is different than if you had a mite that's um, embedded in the intersegmental membrane and feeding on the develop or feeding on the bee. This is, we're looking at these, these um, mites that are just moving around on the adult bees. And I, when I do these assays, um, I screen both the bee and the mite. So I treat it a little bit like a rodeo. So, you know, you don't just grade the rider, you also grade the bull because if the mite's not, if the mite is running around, then you'd expect much more that the bee will respond to that. 
Um, and so, but I do have some of these bees that will respond just like this one at the bottom where the mite's not moving and the bees are really responsive. And then I have almost the opposite where I have mites that are crawling on the face, they're crawling on that fuzzy face of the bee and the bee doesn't even try to swipe at it. And that's all, it makes me so sick to see that because it's like they've given up on life almost. Like they're just letting these mites crawl all over them. And so that is not at all what we want to breed for. We want to breed for these bees like the yellow butt bee here who is really good about going after that mite on her body. And she eventually did get that mite to move off of her, her thorax. And so um, this led us to doing a lot of different studies, which we'll, which we'll talk about a little bit more, um, and that we're able to look at gene expression um, that's in these candidate genes um, that we've identified that are related to grooming behavior. So this is kind of the goal is that maybe we can find these genes that are related to grooming behavior that we can breed for. And so we can do this because we have um, the benefit of the honeybee genome that was published Oh my gosh, 15 years ago, we're aging. Um, it's, a, it's really awesome to have these um, resources available. I know a lot of beekeepers will say like, what in the world? Like, why, why do we need a honeybee genome? Why, you know, when is this ever gonna help us? But this actually allows us to look at mechanisms so that we can understand these behaviors and understand where we need to focus in order to, to breed better bees. Um, when we breed basically off of traits, sometimes we're breeding for um, a mixture of a lot of different genes acting together, um, but really we won't know that unless we're able to tease apart the, these individual genes. And so just as a reminder for those of you who haven't taken basic genetics in a long time, um, what we're looking at is we, our phenotypes are these traits. And those come from proteins, which then come from RNA, which then comes from DNA. And so what we're doing when we're looking at the genotype of bees is we're, in this study, we're looking at the, the DNA as a way to try to increase the, the trait levels. There are some folks who um, do breeding for traits, or I'm sorry, breeding um, for even hygienic behavior, and they're they're using proteins rather than, than DNA or RNA. So there's just different ways that we can go about it. In our study, though, we went for the DNA, so really like the blueprint recipe for um, the the biology of the bees. And I just want to point out too that the breeding takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of colonies to select from. Um, so I, I'm going to, I don't mean to trivialize this study, but it will be, you know, I'm going to go over this relatively quickly and shortly, but it took many years of selective breeding um, and a lot of work to try to find the, the to, to develop the variation that we needed in order to create the stocks for the study. So I don't want you to think that this is something that like, oh, I'll, I can just go out and do this. It's a lot of work. Um, so a lot of colonies are needed to basically measure variation to then um, collect our, our the basically do the, the breeding from. Um, and then we are lucky enough to be able to have that genome and we had a genome center that could help us in doing some of the analyses. And then that creates the situation too, where then even when we know what stocks we wanna breed from, we still have to have a whole lot of um, mating yards. And um, well, in the case of this study, we did a lot of artificial insemination, but we do have to have a lot of um, you know, small colonies that we start out with that we then test and do a lot more development or uh, early assessment of in order to get the stocks that we ultimately use for the study. And so another way to look at this, if you do like genetics, if you don't like genetics, you can zone out for the slide, um, is that we have to have these high and low grooming stocks that we've developed. And so we've been breeding for high and low levels of, of, of grooming behavior using an assay, which I'll show you um, a little bit later on, not the behavioral assay, but um, just looking at, at mites uh, on sticky boards. And so basically we, we do these selected crosses where we have, we don't have inbred stocks, um, like sometimes in plants, they'll use highly inbred um, lines. We don't have those lines, but we do have lines that exhibit high levels of, of grooming behavior and low levels. And so it may not make sense. You may think, well, why in the world, if you wanna look at, if you wanna study the genetics of it, why do you, why are you crossing them and mixing them? So we do this, oops, sorry, that should say hybrid in one word. Um, we create hybrid queens that then carry both of the, the um, uh, one basically one 
allele or one chromosome, one marker from the high strain and then one from the low strain. And then we're not assessing queens for this behavior, right? So we're not looking at grooming behavior that queens exhibit. We're looking at grooming behavior that the workers exhibit. So now we take this hybrid queen and then we do what's called the back cross and we mate her back to another high male, so a high grooming male. And that gives us a population of workers now. So sorry, I should have mentioned the queen wears a crown in these um, uh, diagrams, the worker doesn't. So now we have a worker population that's either has good grooming traits, like both, both alleles or both chromosomes, you expect really high levels of grooming from them, or those that may be intermediate, they're carrying um, both high and low um, genetic traits for um, grooming behavior. So we use this when we do our, our molecular mapping population for our, our actual study. So now we have um, this colony that has individuals that, that vary in terms of what their genetic background is. Either they're good, good grooming or good, terrible grooming. We'll just say it like that. Um, and then we run them through these assays and we, we basically determine their phenotype or their trait. So for that grooming behavior study, um, I basically ran a, uh, thousands of bees through these assays and I looked at how quickly they responded and then also whether or not they responded at all and um, in terms of you know, taking a swipe at those mites. And then we also did at the same time a parallel study um, with the, the colleagues at Baton Rouge um, and looked at varroa sensitive hygiene. So they had already done some, uh, they collected bees that they, that they saw uncapping and removing mite infested brood and then those that weren't. And so we did two parallel studies at the same time um, for both of these behavioral traits against um, varroa mites. So it's a little bit terrible. So you have to, you assay the bees for their behaviors and then um, you take the, the individuals, you freeze them and then you extract their DNA out. Um, and then we use that DNA and we compare it to that hybrid queen. So we sequence, sequence that hybrid queen for her um, genome essentially. And we look at that to try to find locations in the genome where we know there are gonna be differences in terms of uh, a good grooming and a bad grooming where they, might where they would have genetic differences throughout their genome. So we found um, and we designed uh, molecular probes for uh, over 1,500 sites across the genome where there should be differences between high and low groomers. And so that leads us to, we can make these genetic maps. And then through these maps, we're able to find areas where we see high differences. So basically anytime we cross this dotted line here, this is a spot where the, the bees that we saw exhibiting really good grooming behavior versus really poor grooming behavior, they also had really strong differences in their genetics in terms of one of them would all have, or like the good groomers would all carry um, a G allele and then all of the bad groomers would carry a T allele, something where it really segregates clearly with the phenotype. The genotype and the phenotype are highly associated. And so then we're able to go back to the honeybee genome and try to find the genes that are in this area and we call those candidate genes. And then we try to find out which one of those or, or which ones, there could be more than one, that could be possibly underlying this behavior. And so we found um, in this region, there were probably about 25 or so um, genes. Um, and of those, we've, we've detected some that seem like they could fit our story in terms of having some effects on um, neurology and motor function. And so one that was really exciting for us is Norexin. Um, also because norexin has been studied heavily in all um, animals, I'll, I'll say it's a highly conserved gene, meaning that it's expressed in basically all animals. And so we were able to look at some of these studies that were done in mammals. And interestingly, in humans, there are three norexin genes. Um, in honeybees, there's just there's one, um, but there are many slice variants of it. Um, but in humans, one of the associations with norexin is autism spectrum disorder. And part of that has to do, or one of the ways that can be expressed is through repetitive behavior and hypersensitivity to stimuli. So we thought, well, that's interesting. Maybe that's, you, know, you could see how that might fit in with what we're seeing with the bees being 
um, better at grooming, really responsive um, and, and having these leg movements to uh, try to get those mites off of their bodies. And then we were really fortunate that there was also a study fairly recently looking at grooming in mice and showing that norexin was responsible in, in their grooming behavior. So of course this led us to wonder whether or not honeybees um, have this gene underlying their grooming behavior. And so, um, they did some follow-up work after I left. So unfortunately I left for another job. And so they, uh, I didn't have access to the stocks anymore, but we did try to look at that gene and we did see some differential expression. Um, so not only um, is it that they have uh, differences in their sequence, uh, good groomers and poor groomers have differences in their sequence of this gene, but that also leads to differences in the level of expression in that gene as well. So it looks like norexin could be involved in, in grooming behavior in honeybees. So the next steps would be to try to figure out a little bit more, possibly down-regulating that gene to see whether or not that either completely knocks out or completely upregulates the level of grooming um, that you would see in those bees. So really trying to um, fine tune and, and do some more specific studies to see um, the involvement of norexin in, in grooming behavior. Um, and this all leads to, I kind of pointed this before, is that this idea that we could use marker, genetic markers to assist our selection rather than using these phenotypes that are a bit variable in terms of how we actually gauge and, and judge them. And so one of the other benefits of if we can do selection based off of genetics is that we could select for multiple traits at the same time. So, you know, I did mention we did parallel studies looking at varroa sensitive hygiene as well as grooming behavior. And so wouldn't it be great if we could just grind up bees and say, oh yes, the, this, this colony has um, high levels of row sensitive hygiene and high levels of grooming behavior and breed for those colonies rather than having to run many thousands of bees through both of these assays to try to figure out um, which, which colonies has high levels of both of these traits. And I didn't point this out from the start, but the other really cool thing about looking at varroa sensitive hygiene and grooming behavior is that varroa sensitive hygiene, this behavior is going after mites that are reproducing on the developing bees. So this is the reproductive part of the life cycle of varroa mites. Whereas grooming behavior goes after mites that are on the adult bees. So that dispersal or phoretic stage. So really what we're, if we could combine both of these traits, breed for both of these traits at the same time, we'd be going after um, behaviors that attack both parts of the life cycle of varroa mites. And so we think that would be like the best, yeah, you know, the silver bullet in terms of trying to get rid of these varroa mites. Will that be the end of varroa mites? Probably not, I can, I can say no. I think we're gonna have to be dealing with, we're gonna have to tolerate varroa mites uh, a bit longer, but these will be additional tools in our toolbox where we don't have to rely just on chemical treatments or not rely on them as much. Maybe we don't have to do four treatments a year. Maybe we could just do one treatment a year. Um, sure some of you remember those, those good old days when it wasn't um, constantly treating. And then just being able to keep Varroa below that economic threshold. So even if we have Varroa in our colonies, can we keep them below the level where they're causing major harm and um, to the point where we're having to use these chemical treatments? So that's kind of the hope is that we will come up with ways that we can develop and enhance these behaviors in the bees that na nature and natural selection should be selecting for. But I think sometimes um, we humans get in the way a little bit. So maybe we need to let them uh, take over a, a little bit more and, and focus on um, health traits rather than breeding for maybe some of the traits that we're a little selfish on like honey production and, and just gentleness. Maybe we need to think about the health traits that we could be breeding for. I will point out though, it's not easy when we look at things like um, grooming behavior. Um, typically what we do is we look at the mite drops and we look at the percentage that's chewed, which I'll show you some pictures of in just a second. But it's hard for us. We don't completely understand the dynamics of this behavior in terms of, is it better to have a colony that has a lot of mites, but they're, a lot of them are chewed? Like say, is this colony a better stock because it has, you know, it's chewing about half of those mites, which is the level of grooming, half of those mites, but it has, you know, almost 150 mites drop in a couple of days. Is that better than a colony that has few mites, but really low levels of grooming? 
they aren't really taking care of the mice they have, but where does, what does that mean? Will they eventually start to increase in number because at this time point, more of them are surviving because they aren't getting chewed up. So until we have better ideas, I think about the dynamics of this chewing um, behavior, it's hard for us to make these decisions and recommendations, but I think we could be trying to increase the level of this grooming behavior in our colonies um, just as beekeepers. And so I mentioned all this research, but I also wanted to point out the way that you can try to increase um, this, this chewing or grooming behavior in your stocks. And so part of this is just by using sticky boards and taking a look at those mites that fall on the sticky boards. So if you aren't good at identifying mites, um, you'll have to become a pro at it. So you'll have to really be good about looking through the debris on those sticky boards um, and picking up those mites. And then we put them on slides and we mount them belly up so that we can look and see and assess damage. So each one of these slides is from a different colony and some colonies have more than one slide because they are heavily infested. Um, and then we assess the damage. So we look at these mites. Again, I, I look at them belly up. So I look at them this way because I can see all their little legs. And so these are what unchewed mites look like. This is what we do not like to see uh, because the bees were not attacking them at all. What we do like to see are mites like these down here where they're missing legs or they're even missing tips of their legs. And then sometimes we're really lucky and we can see um, basically bites taken out of their body. So that's what we really love to see. And so you can look at those mites that are on your sticky board and then you can calculate the percentage of chewed mites or the proportion of chewed mites. So you divide the number of chewed mites by the total number of mites that you see and that gives you your percent chewed. And so that gives you some data in terms of if you're deciding to rear queens, or if in the fall you're like, oh gosh, which I'm gonna have to combine these colonies, which queen do I keep and which one I don't, this can help inform your decisions in terms of um, what you're going to do, which queen, which genetics are you gonna keep around essentially. Um, I will point out though, it, it again, the dynamics have not been well understood or haven't been studied enough yet. I haven't been able to do a pilot study on this. Well, actually, I did a, a very early pilot study, but it wasn't enough of a pilot study. You have to think about your hive strength. So that's one of the tricky things about sticky boards and looking at mite drops is that it's the same footprint, no matter how strong that colony is. You can have that you can have it be one deep and it's still that same sticky board footprint. It's still that same area underneath that colony versus if you have one that's stacked 10 boxes high. You know, if you have mites that fall, that get groomed off of a, a, a mite or up a bee at box five, it's probably going to land on another bee before it'll, before it'll ever make it down to your sticky board, unless they get chewed, right? So if they get damaged and they can't hold on to another bee, then they're more likely to fall to the bottom. So there's some differences there where we have to consider hive strength and we haven't quite um, integrated that into our assays yet to fully understand it. But I think there's still value in, in doing this. Um, there's groups in Ohio um, and in the Heartland area that have really taken up to trying to look more closely at the, um, the mite draw or the, the chewed mites that are in their own stocks as well as in um, feral colonies and swarms they're collecting in their area. So until then, you know, I, I touched on this before that there's this human behavior that we need to think about and focus on. And so um, I always remind people that your bees, they're, they're so valuable. And I know we love them and there's reasons why we're beekeepers. And we have to keep that in mind that it's our job it's our responsibility to keep them healthy and, and protect them. And so I always show this little video, it's kind of gross and it's kind of creepy, but it, it's always to remind people that these parasitic mites absolutely love your bees. And so if you don't keep your mites under control, your mites are gonna take over and they're gonna, they, they know that their um, likelihood of survival is, is due to these bees. And so given the chance, they're gonna climb all over your bees and they're gonna be all over, like this is, it should gross you out and it should make you wanna do something about your, your mite levels. Don't be complacent and don't think, oh, mother nature's taking care of it. Um, you have to be on top of it because they are on top of, of your bees. And just pointing out too that, um, you know, when those, when those mites get close by and they realize that there's a honeybee there, they climb right up. They know that this is their host. And so it's really, really important that we don't give them the opportunity 
to make contact with our bees because they will start taking over. Oops, sorry about that. Okay. Um, and so part of that, when we're thinking about what can we do differently? So I always point out pictures of some of my own human behavior issues and how I manage my colonies and, and um, mismanage my mites essentially. So, you know, one issue that hopefully you all see here is an issue of spacing, right? So I'm always behind every spring. I'm, I'm sure I'm behind now for next spring already. I don't have all my stands set up. And so when I'm installing my packages, I have them way too close together, right? You would never keep your colonies as close together in, in reality. Installing packages though, I, I'm, I forgive myself a little bit there. But we really need to think about spacing so that we reduce drift that from one colony to another. And you can see here, I also have different color colonies to help encourage the bees remember which colony is theirs, right? So that way um, there's less likelihood of disease transmission with bees accidentally going to the wrong colony. And likewise with spacing, it's thinking about how many hives are you keeping in any one location, right? So oftentimes we do what's convenient for us as beekeepers, but not necessarily what's in the best interest of the bees. So just keeping that in mind of like, what, what would be best for the bees and doing what we can. I know there are limits in, in terms of what we all can provide for them, but really, really just trying to do as much as we can. Again, thinking about your plans for the next year, what can you improve upon? Think more about the bees. Think about um, decreasing the, the amount of, of hives you have in any one area um, in case they do get hit, but also because of things like uh, honey production, which we'll, we'll just touch on in just a second. And then monitoring for varroa mites. This is a, a completely separate um, talk that we could talk about for an hour at least, um, but making sure that you're monitoring and using a reliable monitoring method. So, um, you know, alcohol washes, I, I think, are the, are the way to go um, in terms of getting a, a really good count. Powdered sugar rolls, they're good too, but I see a lot of people not shaking hard enough because they don't want to hurt the bees. And where I am, um, it's so humid that um, it, it, you just get a cakey mess of bees. I call them praline bees because they just turn in, they get coated with powdered sugar and it's just, it's, and goo, like it's just too, it's messy because the humidity. Um, and then thinking about when you're monitoring for varroa mites, thinking about where you are in your brood cycle. So I always point out, I was doing this class and showing them, I picked this colony because my records, and you should always be keeping good records when you're keeping bees. Does my records show that this colony had um, a relatively high level of mites? And so I picked this one to show the class how to do a powdered sugar roll. And of course, do my sugar roll and there's no mites. And, you know, I'm my, I, I love my bees, but I know that they aren't capable of curing themselves of mites. So I took another look at my records and I realized, oh, this is one of those that I had put shallow frames into the deep box. And so paying attention to where do you have brood and do you have drone brood? Because that's where a lot of the mites will be attracted to go. And so that's where the mites were. So that, that was actually helpful in this class to show them um, where things were, not, not always um, on your adult bees, but when there is especially drone brood available, they're gonna be reproducing those cells. So having a holistic approach in terms of understanding what's happening in the biology of your colony can help you figure out where your mites might be or why your numbers suddenly jump or suddenly decrease in numbers depends upon the, the biology of the, the colony. And then making sure that you're doing these monitoring methods before and after your treatment. So it used to just be that we would talk about monitoring before and trying to get everyone to, to just at least monitor before you treat. And now there's um, increased emphasis on making sure that you're monitoring after you treat to make sure that your treatment worked and to make sure that you didn't get reinfested by more mites from neighboring bees uh, or apiaries in your area. And you know, hearing uh, early on before the presentation started that you know, we do have a growing number of beekeepers. And so you end up with many beekeepers around you. Um, and that is um, a source for for um, you getting reinfested. And so, you know, sticky boards can help you determine whether or not, I like, I like keeping my sticky boards in when I'm doing my treatments. And of course, it depends on what treatments you use. Some of them you have to have your, um, your clean screen bottom board closed off. But I love seeing all those disgusting um, mites fall down. Like, oh, I, then I know my treatments work or working. But it also, some folks will see this and they think, oh, but my treatment's not working because look at all these mites that are falling. So you have to know what treatment you're using and when you would expect that sticky board to be clean, when, it, when you would expect no mite drop. In this case, 
this is a sign that the treatment was working because I had this in during the treatment. So that's just part of it. And then also paying attention to other management things that you can do to try to decrease your mites or to decrease your mite population growth. And so some of that does have to do with just doing your splits. So splitting your colonies so that they, um, you're splitting your mites at the same time. That's a really um, simple thing to do, especially uh, in terms of swarm prevention. I don't, I hate chasing swarms. I would much rather go out and split my colonies before they split on me essentially. Um, and so that's, I always recommend people be on top of their swarms and, and do their splits um, to, to keep their mites down, but also to keep their bees and their investments there. There's nothing worse than letting your hard earned um, bees fly away. I mean, just think of it. Those are like little dollar bills flying away. Um, and then also when you do have drone brood, I always try to look um, at that drone brood and see what's going on. I do this with worker brood too, but especially because the drones are not um, as, as valuable in, in most of my colonies because I'm not doing a whole lot of breeding. Looking for these little families, because if you start seeing them reproducing like this, this is a sign that you're, you're on the path to um, higher mite loads very soon. And then also being really careful about things like um, um, bulk feeding out in the apiaries, especially if you have a lot of neighboring beekeepers nearby who may not be treating on the same um, schedule or regime as you. So I oftentimes will um, have found, um, even after I've treated my bees, um, bees on my feeders um, from, I'm hoping other apiaries and not my own, because I've done my, my colony checks and my colonies are clean, but I'll see uh, occasionally a mite on a bee at my feeder. And you've seen bees on feeders, they come into very close contact with one another. And it's really easy for transmission to happen. And so I'm just gonna show you this really quickly of how quickly that um, mites can move from one bee to another. So we're watching this bee right here. She actually has two mites stacked one on top of another. And then we'll have a bee come in on the right-hand side and I'll say beep when the mite transfer happens because it only, it takes just a split second. So we're watching this bee right here beep. So she just picked up one of those mites. So the, they were double stacked here. And then um, just in that moment where she walked over, she picked up that mite off of her. So that's, a, that's how it only takes that split second for those mites to move from one bee to another. So just keep that in mind in terms of, um, again, these, these mites being super, super great um, parasites for our honeybees. And so lastly, I just wanted to, to share this um, resource with you of there was a paper that came out in 2019 that was really awesome in terms of looking at how you set up your apiary, um, not only with the number of colonies, but the configuration can influence your honey production as well as your mite loads and then drifting, which is how mites can then spread from one, to, one colony to another as well as other types of disease. And so just showing that, you know, this is what we typically, how we typically are setting up our hives. We have them all facing the same direction. We like to have them all, or we don't like to, I say, a lot of times they are all white colonies, all facing the same direction, spaced um, you know, not very far apart. I think of a study it was about one meter apart and I'll, I'll admit most of my colonies are not even one meter apart. And they compare, compare those colonies to um, apiaries where the colonies were set up um, in a circle. So they're all going out in different directions. They all were individually unique in terms of visual color or as well as markings on those colonies and then spaced out uh, much more. And so what they ended up seeing was that, well, number one, by having fewer colonies in an apiary, there was a higher likelihood of having more honey production um, per colony. And then the mite loads were lower when they had this configuration, the, the circle and unique colonies that are more spread out might loads were lower and then drifting was, was lower from colony to colony. Um, and you know, we wanna think about this in terms of really making sure that we're not creating situations where we have high robbing. So I know we talked a lot in the past about Varroa bombs, but um, Tom Seeley has been talking a lot too about um, Varroa lures. And so if this colony was dying and weak and unable to protect itself from these robbers because it had um, Varroa mites, these bees, these bees from a healthy, strong colony are now going to leave with honey, but also mites and take them back to their colony. So that's um, one concern is that um, these infested colonies that are dwindling serve as sources for um, spread of mites to other healthy colonies. So just really thinking about that, um, uh, a bigger sense of how we're keeping our bees in terms of managing them for um, 
reduce disease transmission. Um, oh, sorry, I should have changed that at the top. Uh, reducing disease transmission so that we have overall healthier colonies. And so I just want to just remind everyone that you know one one individual behaviors. Um, can really affect other beekeepers as well. And so this is one reason why we want to um, really be together as clubs and associations um, to make sure that we're doing all that we can as a community to keep things like varroa mites under control. And we will make mistakes, that's, that's just part of life and that's part of beekeeping, but really making sure that you're learning from those mistakes um, is really the, the sign of a successful, um, to me at least, a successful beekeeper or a good beekeeper are those that improve upon the mistakes that they make. And I, what I love is that we, with beekeeping, we have a chance to better ourselves every year. And so again, making those plans to improve every year. And ideally, if you have your colonies over winter and survive, you end up with more hives than you know what to do with in the, the spring and summer. And so really striving to be the best beekeeper you can be. Um, and in this sense, by keeping your varroa mites under control, um, I think is, is one of the, the best things you can do for the beekeeping community. And so I'm just gonna thank you all for your time. I know I went long, we started a little bit late too. Um, but yeah, you know, part of it too is being responsible in your beekeeping and, and wearing your protective gear when you should. But sometimes they sneak into your veils. And so it's not always, um, not always uh, as, as safe as you'd like it to be, but I try to have fun with it when I do get stung. So I'll thank you so much for your time. And I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll see if there are any questions. Jerry, I didn't know if you wanted to try to um, moderate questions, or do you want me to just go to the chat? And well, we have um, some questions and some comments in the chat, uh, which you might feel like uh, commenting on yourself. But um, if we allow people to unmute themselves, uh, we can invite questions too. Okay, I just allowed people, people that. are pretty practiced at doing this. They do a good job. Excellent. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, I stayed away from saying, yes, we, we want autistic bees, but we don't want OCD bees, right? Like, I, I, it's terrible sometimes we draw these conclusions to some of these human behaviors, but I think we want responsive bees for sure. Um, so how dominant, so when I used the, when I said like the G and the T alleles, I was just using those as examples. So those are not, um, those are not true alleles that we're actually looking for. So, um, we, I, I don't think that in the grooming behavior, um, the Purdue lab that I was doing this work in, they were supposed to be continuing some of this work. And then my um, advisor there actually had retired. So I'm not sure if the new professor there is continuing on with that um, behavioral trait. But that was one of the, the interesting things that I wanted to look at was to see um, how heritable the trait is. Because if it's a recessive trait, that's going to make things a lot more difficult in terms of continuing to breed for this trait, just like with varroa sensitive hygiene, we don't want to necessarily we don't want to have the pure stocks. But after um, the second outcrossing, the second generation of outcrossing, you really don't see a whole lot of that um, varroa sensitive hygienic behavior. So there's like an, an optimal level of, of crossing there. You want to basically have the the F1 or or one crossing out. Second crossing is, is okay, but really it's that first crossing out. Um, and I don't think at this point we have those data um, for grooming behavior, but that's a really good question. Uh, yeah, I, I do admit, yeah, if I, I'm oftentimes wearing flip flops, and but I pay for it. I get sung in the, the, the toes, but it, I always tell people like, do as I say, not as I do, right? And so I know my colonies, everyone knows their, their colonies more than others. And Especially if I have, you know, first year, if I'm dealing with packages and stuff, I'm much um, less protective around them. But like now that all my colonies are, this is their third season and they're, they're big and protective. I, I'm not out there in tank tops and shorts and flip flops as much as these days. So as far as how can you assess that mite biting behavior? So part of that would be, you can go ahead and use screen bottom boards and then pull off, like leave those screen bottom board or leave your sticky boards in for a couple days. So you'd use, um, ironically, nonstick cooking spray. So like the Pam cooking spray or, you know, whatever generic brand of that. And you spray your um, sticky board so that there's a, a fine level of oil on there. You don't want so much that then the oil um, drips and then the mites can drip off, drip off with that. But you also don't want to have 
um, not enough oil because well, where you all are, are, it's pretty dry. And so if there happened to be a breeze then rice can actually um, come off, but you have to use, um, you have to play around with it a little bit. You'll, you'll learn um, as time goes on. I usually leave my sticky boards under for um, two to three days. It kind of depends on, on the project that I'm doing at least two days. Um, so that I can get enough mites fall that um, I get a good assessment. If you don't, if you don't leave it in long enough and you don't get enough mites, then you're, it's a sample size issue where you're not going to get a, a reliable um, number of, of bees to test or of mites to look at. So you get the, the number of, you count the number of mites that fall and then you look at, you take those mites off the sticky board and you look at them under a microscope. And there's actually some really nice how-to or do-it-yourself instructables. Um, or instructions on instructables um, for how to make a um, dissecting scope out of your using your um, smartphone essentially you build this little stage and you use uh, a, a lens from like a, a laser pointer for your cat kind of a thing I can send you a link for it if you want um, and so basically that's that's one way you can create your own dissecting scope at home um, but some of the phones too have gotten really uh, good in terms of their ability to to do some um, macro um, assessment there, but then you look at how much damage is done to those mites. So depends on how what how detailed you want to get. But basically, if you really want to do something simple, you count the number of mites that show some level some level of damage. Are they missing parts of their legs? Do you see a chunk taken out of their body? And then you divide that by the total number of mites, and that gives you a percent that's been chewed. And so that gives you something that then you can use to um, assess from in the future of like colonies that have really low grooming behavior you may not want to breed from or keep that queen if you're going to do um, if you're going to com combine your colonies in the fall um, those that have high levels um, you might want to keep around but again you have to play around with like uh, a high level a high percentage of grooming isn't necessarily going to be enough if you have you know like a thousand mites that fall in three days that's still a lot of mites <laughs> that you're counting overall unless they were all chewed you know, that, that can be um, hard for you to assess. Uh, let's see. Do you have the Argentine ants in your area? Um, not like in California. <laughs> I remember in California, like if you have a picnic and you leave something, you don't look at it, you leave something out for like five minutes and they're all over it. No, not so much, but we do have fire ants where I am. And that's, um, I hate them even more because they, they sting, they're really bad. Um, <laughs> Well, I noticed that that the Argentine ants will carry away the uh, varroa for food, I guess. So yeah, so that's one reason have... why we try to only leave those sticky boards in for like two days, three days, not an excessive amount of time. Right. If uh, to get a real sense of it, we have to ant proof the hives around here if we're going to make measurements like that. Yeah, yeah, and uh, like elevating hives can help a lot too, <laughs> further from the ground. Um, let's see, how would the hobbyist beekeeper maintain the genetic traits if the genes responsible for growth sensitive hygiene and grooming are available to us commercially? So that's, that's a really good question and it is really tricky. So that's kind of one of the things that has discouraged me a little bit in terms of getting into these breeding programs is ultimately if you get these stocks and you're keeping, if you get these F1 um, queens, you have to keep those F1 queens, right? You can't let them swarm and leave you like get the daughters that are related by 50%. But again, if some of these traits are recessive, you've just lost a whole lot of your investment, right? And so this is a big challenge, even in, in my research, right? I'm trying to, to breed for these stocks. And if I don't check my bees every two weeks, which isn't, or every 10 days I try, which isn't always possible. And then they, they swarm, that's a huge loss. And so you really have to be on top of um, swarm prevention and, and yeah, you have really good record keeping too. So I, it's it's not for the um, the laid back lazy beekeeper I would say. So you really have to be on top of it. I encourage you to do it, but it is a lot of a lot of work. Well, it looked like you were installing packages. Do you then replace all of the queens in those packages with your lines? So at Purdue, um, we rarely got packages. We mostly just did splits, and then we would. Um, yeah, we would basically restock from our own um, stocks, essentially. And we went from maybe like the first year breeding, 
I think it was maybe like eight to 10% chewed mites to like the fifth year of just breeding based off of the, the chewed mites that we see on the sticky boards, not even like the behavioral assay, but just the chewed mites. We got up to over 40% chewed mites after about five years. So it, it is something that you can breed for just by looking at the, the level of chewed mites, but whether or not that's going to cure you of mites and have mite-free colonies, um, no, because you have to have mites in order to actually assess the, the trait. So, um, but I think it is a step in the right direction of, okay, we're going to accept that we're going to have mites in our colonies, but are our bees responding to these mites and giving us some relief from having to just rely on, on chemicals, essentially. And then here, you know, I started packages when I first got in Tennessee in 2019, but I haven't bought packages since. So I think that's something to keep in mind too, of like really thinking about trying to keep the best bees available. And so even within, you know, cause I am a little, I'm finicky about packages because <laughs> it is a package. I always tell people it's a starter package, right? And so you, you're getting what they give you and it's not necessarily a, a great selected queen, but I think you can do a lot even within, you know, a few years of selecting from your own stock and what you have. If you have enough colonies, um, you can do, you can make some smart moves in terms of not only trying to propagate from the colonies that are showing the traits that you really want and like, but also it's, it's harder to do because we all love our bees, is to cull the colonies that have the bad traits. So, right, so we want to move the needle. So think a bell-shaped curve of, and a trait. We want to get, we want to move them this way we can try to just get on the, the high side of things, but also getting rid of the low side, the, the duds can help us move that needle more quickly. But I, I realize it is a hard thing to do to think about culling and killing, but think about it in terms of the easiest thing is when you're doing your fall combinations, which ones are you gonna get, which queens are you gonna get rid of and which ones are you gonna keep? That's I think an easy way to think about it without feeling like you're a murderer <laughs> essentially of your bees. It is hard. Also, I didn't wear my necklace. I usually wear my queen necklace. I always save my queens and I make jewelry out of them so that they live on somehow. <laughs> I, I can't squish them. I just make jewelry out of them because I feel terrible. Our club's swarm hotline handles about 300 uh, swarm calls a year of, of the 700 or so calls that we handle. Uh, so a lot of our beekeepers uh, chase after those swarms and stock or restock their colonies uh, with them. Uh, how do you feel about uh, the the feral bees in your neighborhood? Are you assaying them at all? Uh, so I don't consider swarms to be feral bees. So because um, most of those are coming from mismanaged bees, not uh, not mismanaged, but they're they're coming from um, colonies in in the area. They aren't they aren't truly feral living on their own, right? And so I think that's an important distinction for us to think about, and also thinking about genetics and the, you know, genetics underlie so much of biology, including behaviors. And so I hate swarms. Um, for, I mean, it's, I don't hate swarming behavior, but I, I hate chasing swarms. I hate seeing, you know, when you were out in your apiary and you're like, oh, if I had been there 15 minutes earlier, I could have, I could have split that colony, but you see them flying away from you and you're like, all that money <laughs> and all that investment and they're just leaving you. And so I try to do everything I can to prevent swarming. And some of that also has to do again with culling and keeping bees, the, the colonies that are prone to swarm, I don't propagate from them. So it's, it's counterintuitive, but you know, we get this idea, we go into a colony, we see queen cells and we're like, oh, free queens, right? Like, oh, goody, goody, I'm gonna split this colony, this is fantastic. But if it's a colony that's making queen cells when I don't think it should be making queen cells, like if it's a one deep colony and they have plenty of room to lay, and they're trying to swarm, they're, they're getting ahead of themselves. They're too swarmy, right? That, that's, those, they do not have the right triggers. They're hyper swarmy. And so I cut those queen cells, right? Those are not the colonies I want swarming. The colonies I want to reproduce and propagate from are those that will make queens when I want them to, but will also build um, and not just swarm at the drop of a hat. I can't, I, <laughs> no, I, I try to select against swarming in my bees, but it is tough because I'm only three years in with these um, packaged bees. So 
of yeah. the calls that the swarm hotline gets uh, about, well, it, of 300 swarms, maybe another 200 might be, or 150 might be colonies that have uh, moved into somebody's structure and mm -hmm. uh, are extracted by the folks who do that kind of work. But that means all of those colonies are casting out swarms too. And exactly. And we have a couple of um, uh, persistent callers who have been tolerating uh, colonies of bees in structures on their property without having them extracted. And we get a call or two a year from, from them who say, you know, come collect my swarm. So I'm kind of a believer that there are a lot of swarms out there. There are obviously are, are colonies, feral colonies out there. They're making it on their own. They're not being treated for Varroa. There are some, sure. Um, but there's also just a lot of swarms that re uh, infest old cavities. Too. So, I mean, I can speak to this a little bit in terms of this campus. So I didn't, yeah, I've been here. This is like, what, I'm starting my third year here, crazily enough, but still only this spring that I, that I realized that three of the dorm buildings have these weep holes in all the brick. And there are multiple established colonies behind the brick, but between the brick and the block, essentially, there's there's empty space in between. They're up on the 12th floor, they're up on the fifth floor, they're up on the fourth floor. And of course, they don't wanna, they're not gonna remove the brick, they're not gonna do anything. And so every time I get a swarm call about bees on campus, um, it's on that the non-ag side of campus. And I'm checking my bees every 10 days to, to try and keep mine from swarming. I just, now I can tell them, those are your bees. Those are coming from your dorm. Those are not coming from mine. So if you get a swarm out on that side of campus, that's for you all to take care of until you do something about those that are in their structure. But I think that's another reminder too, that it's really good for us as beekeepers to be responsible with our swarms because when they do end up in structures, they end up usually in structures that are not beekeepers houses and homes and we don't want people to feel negative about um, bees and beekeepers being irresponsible and um, and it's not always just irresponsible but you know like when you get a call from or I get these calls oftentimes from people um, where it's like oh my my walls are dripping with honey and it's like oh my goodness you know like that's way beyond even anything I want to touch or deal with and you know how expensive it's going to be for them to, to deal with that. And so I feel for those people, um, but it's, yeah. So I think it's our job and, and our responsibility as beekeepers to make sure that we're providing that service for the community. Even if it is late in the summer and we're thinking, oh, we're not gonna be able to, you know, we're gonna have to feed that colony if anything throughout the, the winter. It's still our responsibility as beekeepers to get those out of the, the community so they don't end up in the walls of houses. We, like Ms. Great, Ms. great that Ms. you have so many people that are um, tending to those calls. Jennifer, with regard to swarming, um, have, I've heard the, um, the comment that if, if indeed the bees are the first ones to swarm early in the spring, regardless of when that is, that th their tendency to swarm is stronger in terms of genetics. But the bees that swarm more toward the center of the season or possibly even later um, are, are not it's not an issue that the genetics they're going to swarm because everybody else would um, you know so it's it's the genetics of early swarms may tend to indicate a repetition of that genetics where the swarms that come out mid to late season um, are less likely to do that so I think that what's what's going on there are, are maybe a more significant part of that of early swarms versus later swarms, not necessarily that their genetics are causing it, but that it's almost like flip. Those that swarm early on have more of the season to build up their resources and then survive. So in that sense, they're, they're perpetuating their genetics rather than the genetics perpetuating them. So I could see it going both ways, but you know, that's the problem with these late season swarms. It's like, are they gonna be able to build up and have enough resources to get through the winter or are we gonna have to baby them essentially? But the ones that are half, that are swarming early on in the season, they're, you know, especially if it's early in the season, they may still be able to produce a lot of honey, put a lot of honey on, so they will be able to survive the winter. These late 
late season swarms, especially these small little after swarms, um, they have a less likelihood of surviving. And so then that, that, that way they don't perpetuate their, or they don't pass on their, their genetics. Thank you. Sure. Good question. Uh, Jennifer, do you think that by uh, splitting your hives to prevent swarming, that maybe you're masking the swarming tendency <clears throat> that particular kind of bees? Sure. So that's why, for me at least, I, I'm always looking at my records and I'm keeping track of the ones that have other types, what traits I want to promote. So um, that way, I'm splitting colonies based off of which ones I want to split. And then if, if I have some that are wanting to split on there, they're basically like they're showing, they're wanting to split, they're wanting to swarm. I will, you know, I can requeen those colonies with queens from those that do have traits that I, that I do want. But it is, it's hard because early in the season, you may not have enough data from that season, but you can look <clears throat> back from last year's data, assuming that you overwintered them and use that, that information. But it is, yeah, it's, it's tough, but I'm always trying to look at my records and make the best decision overall for the colonies. And again, creating like a master plan at the beginning of the season of which colonies from last season are going to be the ones that I really want to try to um, rear more queens from and which ones are going to be ones that like, oh, they're on my, I'll keep my eye on them list. And then I have my third, my tertiary list that are like, these are the ones I definitely want to try to replace. If they make it through, great. But like, I'm not really counting on those to be um, the, the stock that I'm going to be keeping for the following year. Do you try to keep queens going for two, three, four years? Or I do. do I do like to give them a chance um, because I think that is another issue that we have is, especially you know, if we're not commercial beekeepers and we have a different, you know, we're not our livelihoods aren't necessarily depending on it. We actually have this awesome opportunity that it's not going to be, you know, uh, dire for us if we try some of these queens and we don't requeen. I mean, some of these folks around here will. Like, they'll requeen every six months. And they say, oh, it's because I have to because the, the queens don't keep going. They don't, they don't lay like they used to. And I said, well, how will you ever know if you ever had a good queen? If you get rid of those genetics, there's, then that creates a situation where the breeders have no reason to even come to try and develop stock that lasts for over a year or two years or three years. So I do try to give them a chance. Like I still have some um, green queens in my colonies now. So they're from, um, 19 right <laughs> I, blue is my favorite year i think it's a beautiful color on this on all queens but yeah so i still have some green queens around and so i just try to keep track of that but also weighing that out with not only you know are they laying well but also knowing that younger queens tend to be less likely to swarm and so that's another thing i'm keeping in mind are the older queens are they keeping up in terms of their lane, but are they also going to be more prone to swarm this year? So those are in my notes too about keeping my eye on some of these, um, the older ones that may need to be rotated out for one reason or another. But if they seem to be doing well, then then I let them be. And so I always encourage everyone to keep your queens marked too, so you know what what you have. I mean, that's one of these things of beekeepers who don't have marked queens. I said, like, how do you know who you have, who she is? <laughs> and then like that helps explain things when your grow mite levels go up right because if you know you had a change in queens you had a break in the brood cycle and so if you were assaying your your mice at that time point more of the mites are on the adult bees so it doesn't necessarily mean that all of a sudden you have more mites reproducing in your colony it just means that you had a break in the brood cycle and more of them on the adult bees so when you did your assay you had a higher level but you wouldn't know that unless you knew you had a queen event happen so it's all tied together and it's really complicated but that's why i have written record notes because I don't trust this. I have to have it written down on paper. You do mite washers uh, for every inspection? No, I wish I did, but I, I can't say that I do. <laughs> so part, I mean, I do have a little bit of an excuse that I do have to keep mites around for some of my research. So I do have some apiaries that are um, heavy uh, mite infestation colonies, but I try, you know, it, it, ideally I would be doing it once a month, um, at least during the, the active season. But it's, it's hard when you start getting, you know, like more and more colonies. And telling someone the other day, you know, it's like you have these ups and downs throughout the season, right? Your, your colony numbers, you start out um, at the beginning of the spring low, and then it starts going up. And then in the fall, it, it starts to go down as you condense. 
But really what you're seeing over time is you, you do have these up and down fluctuations, but they should be overall increasing in number, right? So you should be going up and up, but you just have these fluctuations in between. I'm kind of at the point where I'm like, okay, this is it. I don't, I either need more sites or I need more people working for me because this is too many bees. But yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> Um, Mike asks whether the, the uh, bees bred for chewing mites are still as docile as the uh, rest of the bees. Ah, that's a really good question. So it's really interesting because the, the research that we were doing up at Purdue before we were starting to getting, before we were doing the, the selection for mite resistance, um, we were looking, we were just interested in the genetics of defensive behavior. So some of our stocks were just a little more defensive overall. Um, and so some people thought like, oh gosh, is that why these bees are better groomers? Is that they're just more responsive to, the, to anything around them? But the interesting thing is since we were doing genetic studies on all of these things, we don't see overlap in the candidate genes for defensive behavior. They don't overlap with the genes that we're seeing responsible for grooming behavior. And I think it's just happened that, you know, this, this, the first selection for grooming behavior came out of Purdue where we had been breeding for high levels of defensiveness. But I think anyone in any area and like what we're seeing the groups in Ohio and those types of areas where they're not breeding from apiaries that had high levels of defensiveness as a previous interesting trait, um, they're still able to breed for high levels of um, grooming behavior, chewed mites without having this um, added defensiveness. I mean, this, this bees that we work with at Purdue, I've not had experiences like that before or after that lab. There are some of those colonies where we just told Dr. Hunt, we said, you gotta take this colony to your house. Like we can't have this one at the lab. They're just too nasty. And yeah, sometimes they, they change their personalities and attitudes in different environments. So um, sometimes that helps, <laughs> but yeah, they, they were more defensive than other bees that I was used to working. Do you happen to know how many mitochondrial DNAs are out there for honeybees? I don't know. That's a really good question, but I don't know. So that's not, I haven't really looked into that um, in my, my background in molecular breeding. Uh, it's like third hand <clears throat> for poor quality information, but I heard that the number of mitochondrial DNAs uh, decreased substantially when uh, beekeepers like in Wales were selecting for uh, bees that were resistant to or handling the mites on their own. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's, one of the other tricky things about breeding, right? And so if you were doing classical breeding or even if you were doing um, molecular breeding based off of molecular traits, it's not like we just inbreed, right? So you, again, with, uh, I know I've been harping on you all about making plans, but that is part of a real um, breeding program or selection program is you have um, planned crosses, out crosses, that you bring in some new genetics every, at a certain time point so that you aren't just going down this bottleneck essentially. And so you're bringing more in, more genetics, fresh genetics in, but you still are having the majority be what you have bred for, um, at least at, at those particular loci or, or places in the genome. Okay, Greg also asked does, uh, whether VSH uh, in a colony makes them less honey productive. So yeah, there are always going to be some trade-offs, right? And so it's not like, yeah, that I can say like, oh, those are, they're going to be just as productive as others. So there have been other lines they bred since then. So there's the, um, they first came out the, with the VSH lines. Well, first the VSH, VSH line was called SMR. So you may see that if you ever want to look in the literature, SMR then became VSH um, or got renamed as VSH. But even since then, they've now bred VSH bees for um, high level or higher levels of um, honey production. And so now there's the pole line, P-O-L line. And so it's kind of a, a little bit more, it's like the VSH line, but bred for more, a little bit more of like what the beekeepers want traits essentially. So not the, you know, I always worry about people wanting everything, you know, the, the, the perfect bee. And so I always, you know, warn against, you can't have it all, or you can want it all, but you can't have it all. And I always give the analogy, like, I'd love to find the perfect man who's like super funny and super rich and super everything, da, 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 da. But if you start wanting all of that, then you end up with nothing, right? So you have to think about what are the priorities. And hopefully at this point, we think the priority should be health, 
right? Just like it should be like sense of humor or something and not looks, but it should be that for the bees. I think we should be thinking more about that right now um, and not trying to breed for it all. But I think with pole line, they, they weren't trying to do everything. It's not like super gentle and you know, resistant against all these diseases. It was, it was VSH, so varroa um, sensitive hygiene with additional um, honey production. And then now they have this Hilo line um, that I think is also being derived similarly out in Hawaii. And um, I don't know if any of you are larger scale beekeepers, but I think they have been trying to ask people who have um, maybe like a hundred colonies or more to, to try and test out some of the, their queens too, if anyone's interested in that. So I saw oh. Sung Lee raise his hand. Do you want to add? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I know I, I try to uh, um, uh, explain or ask a question that uh, I had uh, is little, I, I, I will I'll try my best to explain and then maybe you can give me some insights of it. Sure. I've been breeding uh, the uh, bees mostly, uh, mostly uh, caught in local swarms. Um, that uh, the last year I raised up to about about 120 queens and this year so far is about going to about 60, 80 queens off of all the swarms caught locally. Mm -hmm. And then I understood that how important it is that my mites under control, they gave us the uh, virus was the issue that I understood early on. So then by doing so, I can see the health of the colony was shown. So then in January, February come around there, yeah, as you, I usually say, we do not have a winter here. <laughs> so the bees will continue to grow. Yeah. Then by February, it starts showing their uh, swarming behavior. Okay. Number one, my I do not know that's which one's right, but because already bees are busting out of their seam, then automatically they are ready to planning to swarm. So I set a two aside, one for the uh, controlling keep adding the box to it and keep my eyes up. I check my bees once a week, regardless. Excellent. Okay. And then, uh, so then I can control that. The other ones let it go. And then they start to swarming. Regardless, I give a box or not, they swarm, let them swarm. Mm -hmm. So then, so my question is, does bees know uh, they swarm because of, I, I, I said uh, last year and this year, by looking at the bees in December, I was able to tell there are gonna be swarming a little bit earlier. It's because of the drone, pres presence of the drone and how early on Quinn was making drone cells. So then I was able to prepare and then aiming at that uh, target. But does, the, at the mother nature, does bees know how many drones, how much drones are valuable to, so that uh, let them, they wanted to swarm. So they know their queens is gonna be uh, don't have any problem where they're getting made it. Number two is the other one is if I'm a really strong, if I have a really strong genetics, mm -hmm. then as an expression of a genetic that I wanna uh, spread my gene by drone or so by swarming it. So is that is that? Uh, but the the question was that the uh, it, is that. Am I seeing it, uh, reading it, the mother natures, they know what they wanted to do. And then also they they want to spread their genetics by swarming it early on, but they know they are strong. Okay, so the question about like whether or not they, they are knowing to swarm based off of drones and, and valuing the drones, that's a really good question. I, I, I shouldn't really speak to that because that's not really my area of expertise. I think I Juliana Rangel at Texas A&M would probably be a really good person to ask that about. But I think that you're probably on the right track where clearly they know when drones are not valuable, right? So they mm -hmm. definitely, assess, you, you see them kicking them out. Um, in later in the season. So they definitely know when there's a cost to them. So I could also see them gauging based off of like when they're starting to see yeah, increased production when it's basically swarm season. And yeah, so I could see some of that there, but I can't speak to it research wise. I don't have any science-based information, but Dr. Rangel um, awesome. might know about that. 
Um, as far as, you know, like the, the spreading of genetics and, and all that, when you think about swarming, it's basically reproduction of a hive, right? Mm -hmm. And right. so in that case, yes, you are reproducing, you're getting um, the, the ones that are reproducing more are spreading their, their genes more. And so that's why someone had asked me in one of my classes about like, you know, what would be the, why would a colony, why would you even have a, an after swarm that leaves with a virgin queen as opposed to a mated queen? It's like, it's still one way that they can go off and, and spread their genes, right? And so if there's enough worker bees, um, some of those after swarms, she may, you know, she'll mate with, a, with males and that other, wherever they end up being, um, but it's still another reproductive unit from that original colony. So thinking about it that way, that like each colony is a super colony or super organism, one unit, and there's, there's essentially just splitting off from that in terms of genetics. Thank you. Yeah, sure. See Gregory's hands up? Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, <clears throat> you know, we have this uh, club locally, it's called the Local Bee Initiative, where we're trying to breed from uh, local bees. And mm -hmm. um, and I guess the, I'm not so sure how to, how to word this properly, but um, it seems like the VSH and the ankle biters really don't play well for like a sustainable apiary, because you say they, they kind of like wash out after a couple generations. Yeah, so that's so, the, you you yeah. you picked up on that, fortunately and unfortunately. So it is a good thing that you mentioned that because I think this idea and, and I think Leslie's question too about you know how do you keep those how do you keep these traits around right if you're just going to lose them. But I think we have to think about our changing our our entire mindset a little bit differently. Where the more we have some level of these genetics in our apiaries overall as we have mutts, but more of these mutts have these traits there, we'll keep some of the, that genetics there. It's not that we have this queen that's been bred for this, but now we have drones flying around that are carrying some of those genetics too. So that it's part of the overall apiary genetic demographic background, but that it's just like, we're not saturating the field per se, but more of it's there than just this one queen that I bought from this one producer and that this one colony has that trait. But just thinking about all of these, these drones that are flying around that are basically flying alleles, but then also having queens that are mating with multiple males, if she just mates with some of those, you know, if she's a chance with mating with some of those males, some of those offspring will, will carry those traits too. So it's, I, I see what you're, you're saying, but I think it's like this idea that we can still improve, I think, on what we have. So. This idea of diversity, I think, is, is key for, for many things in life, um, but especially with these biological systems, to have diversity and for different types of traits, I think, is, is really something to be striving for. Um, and not just, uh, for me, just general diversity. I'm like, well, what does that really mean? You can have a lot of bad diversity, like diverse, but still carrying really bad traits. So thinking about having, having more of these good alleles within your apiary, I think could still be a benefit. But I think that it'd be really interesting to have more research projects on that to really fully evaluate that at what level, like, cause yeah, is it, is it something where you have to have, you know, like 75% of your stock be from whatever and how many years does it take for that to really, you don't just lose it essentially. Cause swarming is gonna just happen. You, Unless you know you're as awesome as, as somebody is with bees, it is hives every week. That's amazing. I know a lot of us don't actually get to go out and inspect, and we do miss some swarms. And so you do, you know, your genetics do change a little bit. But I think there is some hope there. And I think the idea about local stocks too. Again, with things like um, varroa sensitive hygiene, that's a little bit tougher to evaluate in your own stocks. Um, that's why we were actually doing the genetic studies because it's so hard to do the behavioral assay. Um, it's just, even for the researchers, it was too much work. But for things like um, grooming behavior, that's something that you can do if you have decent eyesight and you know access to a microscope or a really good phone or creating one of these devices so you can have a dissecting scope with your phone. Um, working, trying to increase the level of those traits from your local population, your local stock. I think that's a much better way to go than trying to get 
stock, like grooming bees, grooming stock from Indiana at Purdue University and taking them to California, you're going to have so much other genetics that aren't going to mesh well with, I mean, just thinking climate wise in California, that that might be working against you. So I can kind of speak to this a little bit anecdotal. Well, anecdotally, I don't have science to, to back it up, but I know that when we were in Indiana, we bought um, for one of our, our studies, we bought um, queens from one of the major producers in the South that has a fantastic reputation that like everybody loves these queens. We got them, they didn't even last a season for us up in Indiana. And then likewise, when I moved to Southern California, I took some of the, the grooming stock from Indiana down and they did not last a season either. And then when we saw early on, one of the early um, Be Informed Partnership surveys, they actually asked people what queen stock they used and looked, and then again, it's a survey, so it's not a, a strict scientific experimental study, but then the, the beekeepers that were reporting using locally uh, developed or adapted queens were ones that had reported lower levels of losses. So I think this idea that you're breeding from your own local environment, that makes a lot of sense, right? Just like with plants, you're gonna have a much better chance of trying to increase the level of one trait, one little trait uh, across the entire genome of, of whatever your local stock is versus bringing in a completely different genetic background from a different region and hoping that you're gonna keep that one trait when there are all these other things that may be working against you. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, it's oh, complicated but, basically, right? It's like, yeah, ah, yeah. I wish there was a simple answer. Well, but, yeah, we, uh, we we get into it within ourselves about that too. So yeah. uh, it's just good to have another voice on it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's always that easy joke of just being like, yeah, the North and the South, they still don't quite get along. So stocks <laughs> in the South don't get along in the North and vice versa. But I think that there's, there's opportunities there for us to just try to come up with our own little local breeding programs too. I think that that's something that beekeepers can get excited about doing too. Yeah, so I mean, if you look at it that way, you know, these people, these guys who are selling um, VSH queens, and then uh, people bring them in and breed for their, I think you call it F1 generation, mm -hmm. and uh, they get really good queens at first time, but then, you know, that sounds more like it's geared for a commercial operation where the guy could just go that way and, and uh, not have to worry too much about it, but for the guy who wants to do a sustainable apiary, who wants to breed from within himself, that's not going to happen, right? So, well, yes and no. So, I mean, there's there are different. I know it sounds discouraging, but I guess there are some other options that are a little bit in between there. So, like if you were really wanting to to keep F ones around, I mean, if you were larger, ish scale, or if you got together as a group, you know, you can buy a VSH breeder queen. You know, it, it seems crazy to spend like hundreds of dollars on one individual insect, I know. So you have to like be confident in your skills and your ability to keep her alive and, and well and to make daughters off of her. But I mean, that would be one way where you could be bringing in um, and have high numbers of that rather than buying a bunch of individual um, BSH F1 queens, like getting that, um, um, what should we call it? The, the purebred making daughters that then will be the F1s, but then she, those daughters are going to mate with then your local stock, right? So she's carrying the, the VSH line, but she's also gonna be a little bit more locally adapted. I think there's some hope there. I think that that to me at least seems a little more promising. And even if, even if I you know, lose her to a swarm, I still will have you know, some of her offspring Maybe not, I mean, maybe, maybe I'll catch them early enough that they're going to make a daughter um, so that they'll be 50% related, but still even the, the drones that come off of her too, you know, that's still an improvement that I've made versus, I hope there are no package producers in this room, but, you know, like just getting some random stock from somewhere, at least I know a little bit more that these bees came from, from some type of selection that, that, I, that I'm after, that I want. And I just try to think about that just in general with life, maybe, maybe too much, but, but like, just for like every decision you make is somehow selecting for something, right? And sometimes it's frivolous, and so, but I just like to think about that. Like everything that I, every decision I make has some type of impact and especially with my bees. And so I do have moments when I'm out in my apiary where 
I get overwhelmed and I, I literally have to just sit down and write it out of like, what am I seeing? What do I have in these colonies? What do I wanna do? How do I make that happen? Or can I make that happen today? Or is it something I need to come back for in two weeks or a month or something? But really just like sitting down and figuring out a plan rather than just responding. I think that's where I get into the most troubles when I, I see something, I get excited and I respond to it. And I was like, wait, that wasn't part of the master plan. Because <laughs> if, you, if you make plans and you don't stick to it, then it was kind of like, what was the point, right? And so you get off track and then you just set yourself back. It's hard to undo those, those types of decisions. So I try to trust myself early on when I had time to think, not in the middle of the season when I clearly don't have time to think. <laughs> So we have a commercial scale beekeeper in the club. He happens to be our president. He's Jim Garcia. Excellent. And he speculated that uh, among the 400 odd members of our club, uh, each of which keeps several hives, there's probably uh, a few fabulous colonies out there uh, yeah. that could make uh, for uh, selection for, um, for the local BI, our local bee initiative, um, queen rearing projects, for instance. And the challenge then is to identify the people and, and talk them into participating. Yeah, I mean, those types of um, local queen rearing programs, I think it's it's an awesome opportunity to not only, you're never gonna like, people like, oh, you're gonna put all the commercial queen producers are gonna get mad because you're, you're never gonna put them out of business, right? Because like, you're not gonna compete with the commercial beekeepers. But it, I think it's also a really cool opportunity for local beekeepers, especially those who are backyard or sideliners. I mean, it's an opportunity to learn more about a different aspect of bee biology of like rearing queens and thinking about what all goes into rearing a queen and then mating and then drone biology, all these things that we know that happens in the BR, but that's not really our focus. We're, we're just trying to keep colonies. But when you start getting into this, this queen, um, rearing and, and queen breeding, like you, your kind of doors open to these other areas of, of bee biology that we don't always focus on. And I think it's really exciting to think about, you know, think about that queen and think about those drones and just to think like this queen, she's able to store the sperm and she can live for years and she can do all these amazing things. And, and we can help her with that, right? We can, we can, there are things that we have under our control but we have, you know, be responsible with that control too. And so I think it'd be awesome if you guys can um, pull that together. I the thing, it, uh, I'll say this, but please don't take offense to it. But one thing that does become a challenge with some of these queen rearing programs is is the politics involved, right? And so, <laughs> so I see Jim laughing. So okay, so I know you, you kind of get what I'm what I'm getting out there. So it can get complicated. And so it is, yeah, hard, I think, getting the right people involved and all that. But just having constant check-ins of like, again, having a plan of like, what do we want to do? Are we meeting those goals? And are we, you know, not just pushing one person's agenda type of a thing? The, the bees are easy. The politics is first. Exactly. The beekeepers <laughs> that are the difficult part. That's what I always tell you. I just want to deal with the bees. <laughs> yeah, no, that's completely it. But I think if you have a good group of people, I mean, it, it just takes time. You, you're always going to have to weed out some folks. But um, and I think it's a great opportunity to, to try to, to build a community and get people. I mean, it's just an awesome way to get people together to, to share thoughts about things like, OK, what traits should be selecting? What, what should we select for? What, how are we going to do that? What are we going to do? How are you going to do it in your apiary? You're like, if you look at this trait, I'm going to look at this trait in mine. And like, yeah. The, it's an interesting way of, of um, thinking about the beekeeping, um, yeah, I guess community in, in your area. So I encourage you all, but no, it, there, it will come with challenges. <laughs> but it can be and, fun. and the bees don't care. <laughs> they'll tell you, <laughs> they'll, they'll let you know. <laughs> um, if it's not too far afield, uh, speaking of rearing local queens, uh, Robert Silverstein had a a description of a problem in the chat. Uh, and if you think that's not too far afield, if you want to comment on it. Let me open up the chat. Near the bottom, 917. Okay. I'm still depressed by it. <laughs> I know, right? So the, I, know, I was just talking to a veterans group who wants to get into 
beekeeping is therapy. I'm like, it's there. There's mindfulness therapy is real in the moment when you're beekeeping, but when you have losses, it's it hurts. So I'm not sure I recommend it for all them. But okay, wait. many were dark, all were dead. So what? Yeah, what worries me is not. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, you got into the the viruses there. So. I would maybe have an inspector come out and take a look at them because they might be able to send them off for um, sampling to see if they actually do have black queen cell virus. But yeah, the, they, the, the fact that you have all these queens that are not hatched and that they are black and or dark inside, um, that would be worrisome. So I would, I would try to get them sent off for analysis if you can. Um, do you have, is there another batch that you have in development? Because I'm a little bit worried that like these are a few days old now, so it might be hard. I don't... No, but I have uh, several that I haven't opened, the queen cells that haven't emerged. There, I have three or three to five that I haven't opened um, that I just, after looking at uh, 15 of them, uh, uh, and, you know, it's like, okay, I'll, I'll just leave these other ones in here for now and come back another time. Um, <laughs> I always imagine I'm like, I, couldn't they still hatch? And I'm like, okay, it's been like two months. Like they're not yeah. going to hatch. <laughs> like maybe they're just really special and they just need a longer development time. I understand yeah. that. <laughs> like, well, yeah. the, the first one was, oh, that's too bad. The second one, yeah. third one, fourth one, fifth one. Uh, you know, that, that got to be very depressing. And yeah. so I'm just trying to figure out what happened. Uh, this is not my first round of, of uh, queen rearing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've never had this before. And, and were they all, uh, were they all grafted from the same stock or like the same? Yes. Okay. Yes. They're all from actually one single frame out of a, uh, hive that's produced 250 pounds of honey this year okay so um and then they I were had, all in one rearing colony or starter finisher or they was yes they were all in a cloak board colony uh and so what do i you know we're going to start again on monday and and uh, try again uh but you know do we do, don't use that obviously we're not going to go use the same bees uh, that we started with, even even though that they may be just fine. I don't know what we you know. It's kind of a unknown what what's gone on here. I mean, so I you pictures. may want to do both, right? So like get graph from two colonies and mark your mm -hmm. cells and yeah. see and, and make sure you cl you clean your um, your grafting tool in between so you aren't spreading it, but you know then there's also you're going to put them in a common garden colony too, and so if if the problem might be a virus that the, you know, with the call, the black queen cell virus can be spread amongst the workers. Like that source colony could be giving it to the developing queens. There's like multiple spots where this could be problematic. Well, that's assuming that, that that's exactly what it is. I, I'm not even sure right. what it is. Uh, I mean, I have photos I could, and a video of the dead ones I could somehow show here. Um, if any, maybe I can just hold it up. Uh, here, here's. Uh, the, those hives didn't get bounced, or there's no been no vibration during that sensitive period with the queens, right? So they didn't die from vibration. It's possible uh, they may. Uh, the the guy I did them with uh, took them around in the back of his truck um, on the tenth. Uh, to take in the incubator there I, I built an incubator so it, and he's got a plug in the back of his truck so he he took them uh uh around to put them up let's see that's <laughs> not you're turn your back no you've got yeah. a background synthetic background so it's zeroing it out uh do you mind my asking how many years you've been keeping bees seven Seven. Okay. I'm in my seventh. All right. Uh, do you did you come by used equipment? Uh, no. No. Oh. Well, I mean, it's the person whose yard still can't uh, helps to really have the screen on. Here we go. 
is that is that visible? So this is what was inside. So there's a larva that or a pupa that didn't get very far, and those three were you know pretty much uh, what was inside the cells. You know they I, going by the calendar, they should have emerged on Sunday, and so you know we 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 uh, did a our little autopsy there. This isn't so really black much. queen cell virus, you'd expect the inside of the cell to be really black. I can't really tell. Is it possible yeah. that is it maybe is it possible that you had an early hatcher and she went and killed all the other ones? No, the cells are intact. All the cells are intact, and they're each cell is in a separate nuke, mating nuke. Oh, oh yeah, but I mean before you uh, before you put them in the mating nukes. No, there were no hatched out queens. There were there. There was no mean, hatched it, out. No, there were no hatched out queens. Oh. I would call your your local or your. I, for, I don't forget what the California setup is, but call your inspector and have them come out. We don't have one is our problem. Yeah. At all in California? No. Uh, California is horrible. I mean, the, 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 the Alameda, uh, there's a guy that sort of knows bees now, but there, it's nothing like you have in other states. Other states are incredible, but you know, our California, which is odd because we have, we're a big bee state. But, I am going to speak with uh, our uh, California State Apiarist, uh, Alina Nino. So she's your uh, apiculturist. Apiculturist, yeah. Yeah. sorry. <laughs> There's a different, the apiarist would be your, your regulatory person. Your apiculturist is the academic. Yeah, I would contact Alina and ask her if she has yeah. a connection for getting those um, tested for viruses. I'm going to email her either tomorrow and I've got a class with her on Saturday. So. Oh, great. But Dewey's also on Dewey. Did you see anything that you could recognize yeah Dr. no Gary? i did not no not it's so hard that. with photos <laughs> yeah well yeah there's not a really a way of me adding it yeah. to my uh, yeah. to the chat <laughs> yeah yeah I, and, and any and photos don't really tell the whole story right yeah a couple of them were still were young pupa they look like they were pre-pupil and then the rest of them are you know, you can't really tell because they're so dark what age they are. They, they had some dark eyes and, uh, and yet they're dead. Um, okay, well, I, sorry. I'm sorry to, uh, you know, go off track here. I would. Uh, I wish I had an answer for you. I'm sorry. That's just yeah. like, it's always hard when you're like, okay, I'll try again and I'll just cross my fingers. I'm like, oh, that never feels good. Well, we're going to. 91% bad, I mean, <laughs> alcohol, all the tools, and uh, yeah, get rid of that that cloak hive. You know, do di get different a couple different hives to, to uh, create a new cloak uh, system for for raising them. And yeah, hopefully it'll just that. be a, a fluke thing, and everything from this point on will be okay. And you'll just be like, I'm not sure what happened, but it's not happening anymore. And it's been a weird year. My batch before this one, the incubator uh, stopped working for 24 hours. Oh, no. So we had three mature out of the whole batch. Three emerged. I talked, I talked to Randy Oliver and Alina about that. And Randy had the same exact thing happen to a batch of his like the week before uh, I had that. And and his son said that they all, you know, so, some of them emerged, but their mating was terrible. And um, Alina said, oh, it's, I'd be, wor it'd be worse if I would worry more if the temperature went up, not down. But, you know, 